is a 2003 BMW M3, and it's cool. The new BMW M3 is also cool, but in a different way. This is old school analog BMW, shows us how the M cars really used to be. And I think the E46 M3 is going to go down as an iconic BMW M car. Today, I'm going to review this M3 and show you why, and show you all of its quirks and features. <laughs> Before I get started, big news, this BMW M3 is currently for sale, being auctioned live on cars and bids. This M3 has a six-speed manual transmission and all the big stuff has been done. Rod bearings, Vanos, subframe reinforcement, and it's offered with no reserve. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this M3, where you can bid on it and and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the E46 M3, and I'm going to start with a little overview of this car. This M3 was a big deal, but especially here in North America. This is the third generation model. When the first generation M3 came out, the E30, it was not particularly fast. It had a four-cylinder engine, and it was tuned more for handling than straight-line muscle car performance. The second generation M3 was the E36 model, and that that car was detuned for the North American market. In fact, it got a worse less powerful engine in North America than it did in Europe. So the first two generations of M3 were kind of neutered to an extent, especially here in North America. And then came this. The E46 M3 debuted in the early 2000s, and here in North America, it finally had all the power of its European counterpart, and it was a lot. This car used a 3.2 liter six-cylinder engine. They call it the S54, and it was 333 three horsepower and about 265 pound-feet of torque. That was a big number for a car this size, especially back then. This thing could haul, and it was finally the high-performance M3 that people had always wanted. One interesting thing under the hood, you can see this giant bar going across the engine bay, connecting the strut towers, obviously, to add rigidity. And at each end, you have the M logo. You can see on both sides, because they only put that bar on the M cars to improve their handling performance. And so, the M's got the M badges. Now, as for body styles for this car, the E46 M3, there were only two choices. You could get a coupe, like this car, obviously, or you could get a convertible. That was the same as the original M3, the first generation. The E30 M3 was offered as a coupe or a convertible. The second generation car, the E36, could be coupe, convertible, or sedan. There was a four-door sedan version of the E36 M3, but when it came time for the next gen, they didn't do another sedan. It was just Cooper convertible. I don't know why. It's kind of a shame. I think an E46 M3 sedan would have been great. BMW did experiment with a wagon version of the E46 M3. They made a prototype, but only one, and they didn't put it into production. So this car was coupe or convertible only. But while this car's performance level was a big deal here in North America, also important was the transmission situation. The E46 M3 was offered with a six-speed manual, like this car has, as you can see, or you could get an automatic but it wasn't a traditional automatic. It was called a sequential manual transmission, which meant that it didn't use a torque converter to change gear like a regular automatic, but instead it had a clutch. But it was an automated clutch, you didn't use your foot, and you could shift gears with paddles. A lot of sports cars in this era were offering these sequential manual transmissions. Ferrari F1, Lamborghini E-Gear, Maserati Cambio Corsa, and the M3 was the first BMW here in North America to offer it as well. Now, there were some benefits to the sequential manual transmission, or SMG as BMW called it, including relatively quick shifts. But over the years, it's developed a reputation for being kind of clunky and abrupt to shift, and less reliable than a manual, and just less fun as people kind of flock to these old school analog cars with three pedals. But for the M3, those are the only ways you could get it, the true manual or the interesting sequential manual, which at the time seemed like the frontier of innovation. 
But anyway, moving on to some of the quirks and features in this interior, let's talk interior quality, which is fantastic. I have always loved BMW interiors from this era simply because of the way things look and the way they feel. Every button you press has like a weight to it, and it just feels nice and good and high quality when you push it. The radio, the climate control, it doesn't matter if you're just turning on the air conditioning, it feels good. And I have this weird thing for turn signal stocks in vehicles and I've always felt that this era of BMWs had the best feeling turn signal stocks. The way this feels when you push it, and you push the turn signal a lot, maybe a little bit less so in a BMW, but still, it feels good flashing the lights. I just always have loved the feel and look of everything in this interior. It just feels high quality. Modern BMWs are also very high quality, but the focus is on technology and screens. In this car, it really was on kind of a nice feel in here, and it did feel nice. And by the way, on the subject of modern BMWs and their technology and their screens, it's important to point out that this car doesn't have one. Take a look in the center control stack and you can see old school buttons for the stereo, the climate controls, and no screen, no navigation system, no in-car apps. This was kind of the last BMW, certainly the last 3 Series model that didn't have a center screen. And it's the same deal in the gauge cluster. Again, no gauge cluster screen in there, no configurability like modern cars. You don't have any of that stuff. It has this old school feel. Worth pointing out though, with that gauge cluster, one interesting and kind of cool thing the red line changes depending on the car's level of engine warmth. So when you turn it on, you can see the red line is here, and it's pretty low, like 5,000 RPM. Well, you don't want to go past that when the engine is cold. But as the engine warms up, these little red lights start to disappear, which allows you access to more and more red lines since the engine is ready to be revved that high. Kind of an interesting idea. Also worth noting, another BMW hallmark, particularly from this era and earlier, the center control stack is tilted towards the driver. It's not just in the middle facing the general interior. BMWs were driver's cars, and so the stack was tilted in the driver's direction, giving the driver easier access to the stereo and all that. Obviously, the passenger can still reach it, but the point is it's driver-focused. Also worth pointing out on this center control stack, you do have a sport button. This wasn't really all that common in cars from this era, except very high-end cars. Drive mode changes weren't a big thing, but it started to come into play here in this car did have a sport mode. Next up, another quirk I like in this interior and other M car interiors from this era, the steering wheel stitching on the inside is the M colors. You can see blue and red sort of interchange, which I think is a really cool look. And actually, I think the look of the M stuff in this interior is generally pretty cool and very subtle. For instance, you get this M dead pedal down here, which looks kind of neat. You also have M on the top of the gear lever to remind you of your M-ness when you shift gears, and you have M3 on the floor mats, but it's pretty small off to the side, and that's basically it, honestly. There's not other M badges all over the interior like you get in modern M cars, where you have it on the headrest and stitched here, and it's on the dashboard with a plaque and the center console, all that stuff. Not the case in this car. It's a lot more subtle, a lot more kind of you gotta know, and not just over the top M throwing up on you. Next up, another interesting quirk in this interior. In the center console, you can see around the gear lever, you got window switches to front, of course, but also to rear, which is weird because this is a coupe, usually rear windows don't roll down, and indeed in this car, they don't roll down either. If you push the rear window button down, the window doesn't go down, it goes out. It's pushed out electronically. As you can see, there's like a little arm that pushes the window out and allows for some rear seat ventilation. If you pull the window switch up to roll the window up, well, then it just closes. <laughs> that ventilation window. Kind of interesting to have power vented windows controlled like this. Also interesting in this M3, you get your center armrest here in the middle, no surprise. You lift that up and there's this little panel here, which kind of makes it seem like you should push it. You do that and it reveals this rotating coin storage slot. The coin storage pops out and there are coins in there, which of course I will steal because the owner of this car has forgotten about them. But you close that slot and away goes your coin. 
coin storage. Also interesting in terms of storage in this car is this panel directly below the radio and climate controls. You push it and then it pops out and kind of bows in front of you, like opening itself to make it easier to store things in there. And then you put stuff in and you can just close it right up. But I do like how it comes out and lowers itself to you to make it that much easier to actually use. By the way, also interesting in the center control stack, between the two central climate vents, you have this dial, which you can adjust and it changes color from red to blue. BMW models from this era all have this dial, and I've always thought it's one of the strangest features on any car, because the color shown on this dial corresponds to the temperature of air that comes out of the vents, regardless of what you've done on the climate controls. Meaning, you can turn on the climate controls to the coldest possible air, turn on the air conditioning, ramp up the fans, lower the temperature, and as long as this little dial is showing red, you're gonna get warm air out of these vents regardless. It totally overrides everything that happens on the climate controls. I don't understand why anybody would want this, but BMW cars have it for some bizarre reason, and there it is. And by the way, other interesting decisions in this car from BMW relate to blank items that are clear cost-cutting measures. Over on the passenger side, you can see there's a grab handle where you can like hang your dry cleaning or whatever. You don't have one on the driver's side in basically any car, but in this car, you have little blanks where it would be on a right-hand drive model. They would flip everything over to that side and then the handle would switch and they just kept the blanks there on left-hand drive cars because it was cheaper. Same deal with the power mirror controls. Over on the driver's door panel, you can see the power mirror controls are here, pretty simple and standard. On the passenger door panel, there's a blank for mirror controls that don't exist, but they do exist on right-hand drive cars, so that blank is there, so BMW could save a little money. Now, as for the back seat of the E46 M3, not too much to talk about back here. It's a pretty small and not very exciting or quirky back seat. You do have this little storage cubby back here where you can stick stuff, I guess, and a center armrest can drop so you can rest your arms, but that's about it in terms of interesting backseat things in the M3. One unusual thing that is lacking in the backseat is a control for those rear windows. You can only open the vented rear windows from the front seat, even though it directly relates to the backseat people, you couldn't control them back there. And next up we move on to the cargo area of the E46 M3, or the trunk, which is actually quite large. Doesn't really look it on the outside, but it's surprisingly big on the inside. And if you need even more space, there are releases back Back here for the back seats. You can see up at the top, you pull on those and then you can push a large item through. The seats will fold down if there's something especially big that you want to carry with you in your E46 M3. One other interesting item of note on the inside of the trunk lid, you can see this big panel here. This contains a tool kit. You unscrew this black plastic piece and then it pops down and there is your tool kit so you can perform basic roadside maintenance in your M3 should you have an issue. Interestingly, in modern BMWs, this is not a toolkit. Instead, there's a little label in this exact spot giving you the phone number for BMW roadside assistance. They know that modern BMW owners aren't gonna be working on the cars on the side of the road, and that's kind of a difference, an interesting evolution in BMW toolkit situations. But that's the trunk. But anyway, next we move outside the E46 M3, where there are surprisingly few changes compared to a standard E46 coupe, which is very different from today's situation. One obvious change was the flared fenders, which is especially noticeable in the rear, a little bit wider, a little bit more aggressive, and of course you had bigger wheels in the M3 to go along with that and give it sort of a more exciting look. Maybe the most obvious change on the outside of this car was this little fender grille. As you can see, it says M3 in it, and the regular BMW 3 Series models didn't have that. In fact, this was something that BMW kind of pioneered in this era, and then it spread to a lot of different vehicles. It was originally on like the Z3 and the Z8 in the late 90s, early 2000s, then it made its way to the M3 and the M5, and then other automakers started using it, and a lot of them. <laughs> Eventually, Buick was signifying that you got your Lucerne with a V8 if it had this little fender grill on the side, like BMW had made popular. And then people started buying fake ones. You could get like fake stick-on fender vents just like this. <laughs> 
that looked cool, but obviously they were just stuck on your fender to make your car look special. That was kind of all the rage in the early to mid 2000s, and this car was one of the ones that started it. But other than that, not too many changes on the outside. It is a relatively restrained, relatively subtle design. For instance, up front, the grill. You can see the old school of BMW front end, not the huge, massive thing that the current car has that shouts to everyone, look at me, I'm an M car. This car was far more subtle, far more restrained. It came from the era of you have to know to know, which is very different from how a lot of modern customers even see their cars. They want people to know they spent big money for the M3, and that just wasn't the case here. In fact, badging in this car is even subtle. You have one big M3 badge on the back, and then you have little M3 badges on these side fender vents like I showed you, and that's it. Nothing in the grill, no huge M3 on the outside anywhere, the brake calipers, whatever. It was all pretty subtle, and it was kind of a if you know, you know sort of thing, which was sort of a cool departure from what we have today. Now, with that said, one other thing that shook the subtlety of this car just a little bit around back, you did get quad exhaust pipes, which was also distinctive to the M3 compared to the standard 3 series. It always looked cool, more aggressive, sportier, and it helped set this car apart a little bit more. Now, other items worth pointing out about the E46 M3, the curb weight is around 3,400 pounds. So this car wasn't particularly light, but it also wasn't excessively heavy either. The other interesting thing about these M3 models is they had issues with their rear subframes. The rear subframe, if you don't know, is a structural piece in the back of the car on the bottom. It's where important things are mounted, like the differential and the suspension components will be mounted to the subframe. And in a lot of M3 models and other BMWs from this era, the rear subframe would start to crack and have problems where it would come apart, which is an issue because it's structural to the car. Now, fortunately, as this was discovered, there were kits available to reinforce the subframe, and this car has had that installed. So the subframe issue shouldn't be a problem in this car, but this was an issue in some BMW models from this era. The M3, the Z3, the Z3M, I think the Z8 even had subframe problems. Not really BMW's best situation. That's not something you want to be coming apart but in some cases it was. All right, driving the E46 M3. Now, I wanna be clear about something. I have a lot of seat time in E46 M3s. I've driven probably eight or nine of these a long distances, a lot over the years. So I'm only driving this car so I can talk to you about driving this car. I'm only gonna drive it for a few minutes. Um, first thing I wanna mention, this car somehow has 165,000 miles on it. To me, that's amazing given the condition of it. <laughs> um, the owner of this car bought it on Cars and Bids like six months ago and now wants to move on to something else and so he's selling it. But um, it's in really nice shape considering the mileage. And frankly, it drives as well as any E46 M3 that I've ever driven, which again is quite a few of them. Let's get up there, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. When this car came out, I was 15, you know? And so this was like, for me, one of those cars that like you, you dream about as a kid. You know, your dad's got a Camry and you just so badly wanted an M3, which this was at the time. And I remember it was a beast. Like there were guys on a couple forums I was on that had them. And it was like, oh man, that's so cool. Like that was the fastest thing anybody could imagine. And as I drive it now, it's not that at all. It's not really all that. I mean, it's fast, but it's not like insane. Now, to me, that's actually a plus because as these older cars start to get even older, I mean, this is almost 20 years old, they, they're not fast by modern standards. I mean, any electric car now will do zero to 60 in three seconds, you know, it's faster than a Carrera GT. Um, so what you're, you're not really looking for the acceleration that you once were from this car. What you're looking for is the feel, the experience of the car. And this offers that in droves. Um, Steering is one thing. Hydraulic steering, like a good old school car, and this was BMW's era. Like this was when they were not building electric cars of questionable enjoyment capability. They were building like true sports cars. You know, the early 2000s, late 90s was BMW's era. And this was one of the pinnacle cars from that time. 
So you have this amazing steering feel and it's just so good. The precision of the steering is not like in quite like in a modern car. You move the wheel a little and you don't get quite as much like instantaneous moving of the car. It's more about the handling. It's the feel of the steering as you go through a corner, the feedback that you're receiving and then what the car does with that feedback. It doesn't feel light. It doesn't feel too over assisted. It just feels like very confidence inspiring and like a little bit like it's kind of, you know, you're doing something. You're doing some work because it's this hydraulic steering. Then you have the clutch pedal transmission situation. Um, I think that the gear lever in this car is too rubbery feeling for me. I, I've always felt that about kind of more modern BMW shifters. Uh, and that's the case here as well. I wish that it just had a little bit more weight to it and a little bit less kind of rubber feel as you go into gear. The clutch pedal though feel though is great. Um, you can easily rev match. There's no like kink to it like there is in a lot of BMWs I've driven. It is very smooth and it just, it just has that damn feel. You have this thick steering wheel. You have the great turn single stock. <laughs> I just love how this car drives. Every time I drive one of these cars, it reminds me how great this car is. These cars last year, like a lot of cars, shot up in value and they've come back down. The market has slowed a little bit, but I don't think that's a permanent thing. I think that these will eventually become more and more valuable. When I was younger, kids were modding these, dropping them, putting you know neon lights on them. A lot of these cars got crashed, damaged. A lot of them were automatic convertibles, which are less desirable. You know the stick coupe is like the one and they're just going to become more and more sought after and this car is just cool and it's fun and it does what you want it to do and it feels like the old school and that's why i think that these cars are going to become more and more desirable you just can't get this anymore and so that's the E46 BMW M3. This is a special car. It reminds us of how BMWs and specifically M cars used to be. The new M3 and M4 are great cars and they have a lot more power than this, but they also have a lot more weight and size and technology and stuff. This still feels like an analog car with a pretty pure driving experience and it can be yours on cars and bids. Anyway, now it's time to give this E46 M3 a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 56 out of 100, which places the E46 M3 here against a lot of similar cars. Frankly, it fits in right where you'd expect, ahead of the E36 M3, which came out right before the E46, and behind the E92 M3, which came out right after. Overall, the E46 M3 is an awesome car, and it recalls a tremendously special era in BMW's history, and it's an old school analog car in the best way.